for a very, very long time, <coughs> Freud regarded <coughs> that every human being is fundamentally accentuated, you know, whatever he or she does, by the thought of danger. That is, <coughs> of losing one's life. So, the fundamental instinct of man is self-preservation, trying to minimize danger situations, trying to save oneself. This is one reason why, in interpretation of dreams, it was, it was basically about wish fulfillment. In thinking about human beings' reaction to danger situation, <clears throat> the first, the primordial reaction that man has, uh, Freud called it the ostrich reaction. Meaning the first reaction is to put your head down. I don't wish to know what's happening around me. Right? Which in many ways sums up the present Indians. <coughs> Uh, one might also be reminded of a great poem by Shudhirana Dotto Utpaki. Kothai palave dhudukare murubhumi, khoye khoye chaya more gachi padutale. I am not suggesting that Shudhirana Dotto picked up the metaphor of Utpaki from Freud, but possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Shudhirana Dotto was deeply influenced by Freud. <coughs> Everything changed. All, all changed for Freud, the end of First World War. Um, I have said this, I shall keep saying this. Psychoanalysis, as a kind of a science, develops in tandem with great political events of 20th century, in reaction and in response. In fact, one might even construe this, psychoanalysis is a kind of a protective coloration that comes out in trying to fend dangers produced in 20th century. <coughs> the First World War ended in 1918. The peace conference was held in January 1919 and uh, Germany had to accede to a number of humiliating conditions from the Covenant of the League of Nations in the forefront, the Treaty of Versailles. I mean, from here begins the story of Second World War. Had, had to hand it so severe terms to Germany that I miss other losses, the super or over nation in the making, lost control even over her overseas possessions. Now it was in this climate of jubilant jurisance of victors and stunning trauma for losers, the Sigmund Freud stationed in Vienna, right, crucial, the cultural hub of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy which had just vanished. Right? Vanishing is the stage, began to write beyond the pleasure principle. <coughs> um, <coughs> he completed the he started on the first draft in March 1919. In January is the treaty, in March 1919, Freud begins. Working at a furious pace, Freud completed the book in May 1919. Revised the draft in May, June 1920. Book was ready for print in July 1920. <clears throat> so, again, repeat, Beyond the Pleasure Principle appears exactly at the point when the Austro-Hungarian Empire vanishes. <coughs> Nothing is more confusing, more messy than beyond the pleasure principle as a text. Because this is not a text which is organized in any kind of a linearly logical fashion. It is rather organized in terms of thought itself. That is, whatever occurs to me is spelt out, and then my immediate reaction is to 
go against it, try to argue, try to uh, <clears throat> annul, cancel out whatever I have just said. And whatever excess remains by this push and pull becomes my material upon which I proceed. That's how I gain, how I, I work through. So it's full of contradictions and full of, but the author himself is getting afraid of his own thoughts. He's trying to pull them back. He's trying to fight with himself. It's, it's more like a diary than a finished book. The, the, the incompleteness of the text doesn't come from the fact that it is not fully written. It is fully written. Right? But the incompleteness seems to be the principle of writing. Right? <coughs> because, in some sense, Freud has decided, as it were, to combat all his own received notions. As if psychoanalysis, he is the first enemy of psychoanalysis. He's going to declare a war against whatever has been done so far. And therefore, he's going to concentrate upon questions which could not be answered in the previous structure, previous framework. The real difficulty with the previous framework, his weakness was, is emphasis upon self-preservation. Now, what is the symptom of this overemphasis, or rather privileging of self-preservation, trying to articulate a theory of human psyche solely on the idea of preservation? Uh, this is how it begins. I mean, not begins. This is how we, the symptom of that, of the the of the structural <coughs> weakness of the earlier part of psychoanalysis is this. He had already confessed. In fact, it's a confession. In 1915, uh, just about four years before this, in an essay called Repression, right, that the case of pain is too obscure to give us any help in our purpose. Then again, in 1926, even after we are on the pressure principle, he says, we know very little about pain. Now, pain, see, if you believe in self-preservation as the fundamental axiom, then pain becomes what? Merely a kind of a <coughs> sensory, sensory proof of the fact that I wish to be preserved. Right? It's only a thing which keeps you, make, makes your life dangerous, right? It is something which is threatening. <coughs> well, since I just have one hour, I'll cut short this story. Uh, but I'm keeping some, something, Ricky. <coughs> Beyond the pleasure principle is, a, is genuinely a storehouse of ideas. Many of them half processed, only half gestured, half muted, one quarter muted, expressed, etc. Some of these ideas he would develop later. Some would get full development in the book itself. And many would be forgotten. He would not work upon them. And later theoreticians can, of course, pick up from uh, this peculiar book. <clears throat> In this book, among many other things, I'm only going to talk about two, Freud proposed two ideas, among many others, as being vital to human psyche. Vital not in the sense that it is important, vital in the sense that it is systematic, that is integral to the human psyche. <clears throat> and the production of these two ideas takes place in Freud's book in the space of five pages. <clears throat> the first, upon which I shall not spend too much time, is <clears throat> primary masochism. Now, the word masochism is coined by Kraft Ebbing, von Kraft Ebbing, the other Viennese, uh, the, psych the psych psychologist 
who was much senior to Freud. <clears throat> In fact, this was what the biographers tell us, that Freud was about 35, and he had given a lecture at, uh, in Vienna, and the lecture was uh, chaired by Kraft Ebing. And after Freud finished, the chairperson said, Bob, all this sounds like a fairy tale. And Freud was then promised himself that never will he ever give a public talk in Vienna. And he did not. Just before leaving for London, he gave his last kick to Vienna. Freud genuinely hated Vienna right, as the capital of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> and that much of his people are Viennese, all the, that, that is analyzing, might tell us that the, that the human story that Freud will have to tell us would be very sordid. John Ford had requested someone to produce his film script on Freud. And <clears throat> the man did so. And <clears throat> of course, he, he was no respecter of time. So the script, if, if it had actually been turned into a film, it would have gone into five or six hours. So the director requested the script writer to shorten the script. And in response to this request, the script writer doubled the script. Mm -hmm. And when the film was, was, of course, was made, and the script writer requested the film director not to spoil his name by including it in a Hollywood film right, on Freud. The scriptwriter is Jean Paul Sartre. Uh, and, <laughs> and he's lays in the, in the script a special emphasis on Freud's personal relationship with the Viennese. Right? Because he's after all going to produce an impersonal theory. This is very important because I, we don't have the time to go into that, that in his psychoanalysis, the actual work, you'll have to think of a certain techniques, for example, how to stop projection, etc., which are also deeply embedded in the kind of relationship he abides. All his people who are coming to him, most of them hate Jews. Like, suppose, what, have, what do I do in this goddamn country if I'm a Muslim psychoanalyst? <laughs> what, what kind of relationship will I establish with my clients? I have to live, I have to get your rupees, but same, same kind of situation. I mean, it's absolutely comparable. <coughs> now, <coughs> Kraft Ebing coined the term mesochism as a counter to sadism. Sadism had, was coined, is already available in French language, in French quarters, uh, from, from Marcus de Sade, the Enlightenment philosopher. He's a philosopher, actually. Right? And <clears throat> for craft giving, so sadism meant for craft giving, uh, <clears throat> uh, obtaining pleasure by inflicting pain on others. Now, he read an Austrian novelist, Masok, and whose novel was all about a man trying to submit himself to a, a lady, right? A very submissive man. Now, you can check internet. Oh, In, the, in this context, you might read a very, very good book called Coldness and Cruelty by Deleuze. <coughs> uh, <coughs> now, what Kraft Ewing did was, as it were, he filled up the empty space. If you have somebody called the sadist who obtains pleasure by inflicting pain on others, then obviously you require an obverse to fill it up. Somebody who obtains pleasure by receiving pain. And from the word from Mashok, he called him a masochist. 
Mashok was alive, and he took great umbrage at the fact that his name was being, uh, his name was being defiled by such stuff. Here is an example of Freud picking up a concept which, belong, which is not produced by him, right? Said uh, masochism. But of course, Freud deeply disliked the originator of the concept. So almost there is a compulsion in him to do something to the concept which the other fellow couldn't have thought. What he did in the process is revolutionary. Please note, in the craft ebbing construction, the masochist and the sadist are binary opposites. Right? From here follows the great paradox. So who is the hap what, how do you create the happiest couple? Suppose there is a sadist man and a masochist woman, or vice versa. Put them in a room and tell them to do whatever they like. Do you have the happiest sexual couple? No. No. Why? Hmm? Yes. yes. See, but the point is the sadist obtains pleasure by seeing that you're getting pain. But the, the masochist is getting pleasure. So when the sadist realizes the more I hit you, the more you like it, my pleasure will diminish. Actually, the sadist and the masochist are best misfits. So all marriage predicated on this kind of relationship is bound to end in divorce. One reason why that divorces take place. Anyway. Uh, uh, what Freud does to the concept is, masochism is not a direct opposite of sadism. <clears throat> there are many, many ways of approaching, but the final point is, he, will, he, will, he accepts that masochism and sadism are integral to the, uh, sorry, there are two things, masochism and sadism. But only masochism is integral to the human psyche. He would call it primary masochism, while there is no such thing as primary sadism. A sadist is a completely historically produced entity, while the masochist the state of masochism is part and parcel of a characteristic of the human psyche. This distinction that I, I'm not going to have a primary citizen, but I'm going to have primary masochism, opens the route for what? Number one, you have now, you, you can have to think of economy of pain, right? Which so far was being excluded. This also becomes an entry point to think, in fact, the revolutionary statement, that there must be something called death instinct in man. Man is not only trying to preserve himself, but man is also trying to expend himself. Both are <clears throat> interlocked. And primary masochism is that constant companion and reminder of the death instinct. Right? So obtaining pain has this tacit pleasure because all said and done, death is pleasurable. Right? And um, <clears throat> therefore, fear of death linked to that is self-preservation, and courting death, almost having a sexual relationship with death, is another aspect of human psyche. Unless this is so, one could not, one cannot even begin to theorize suicide. For example, we look at Durkheim's book on sociology, sociological enterprise, called suicide. What remains unexplained, why do people at all commit suicide? What makes it possible? Because if if self-preservation is the only fundamental instinct, then how is death by myself possible? Mainly explained in terms of sociological reasoning, it doesn't seem to be adequate. Now I'm going to read the historic uh, paragraph. Or rather three lines. Don't ask me. Don't ask the answer for the first sentence. I mean, it is constructed in a form of a question. I'm sure Freud is also, by this time, he's so confused that he doesn't know what he's saying. So he says, but what is the important event? This is in from Beyond the Pleasure Principle. But what is the important event 
in the development of living substance which is being repeated in sexual reproduction? I mean, what does the question mean itself is very, very tense. When you're saying every sexual reproduction, there's a repetition of an important event. What sense does this make? Let's continue. Guess what, how Freud answers the question? Yes, he, he himself has raised the question. Okay, the Kubalan, he has raised the question. And next sentence is, we cannot say. <laughs> well, this is the style of writing of the pressure principle. Some <laughs> question hits him, he says, then he says, oh, I have no answer. Who asked you to ask me? Okay, go uh, we cannot say. Then comes a startling sentence. And we should consequently, consequently, consequent to the fact that I can't answer the question, consequently feel relieved if the whole structure of her argument turned out to be mistaken. <laughs> because I can't answer this question, therefore this gives me a great sense of relief that my entire structure of argument is wrong. This is a peculiar thing happening in this sentence. That is, he has already thought of a theory, but he's so afraid to spell out that he wants to kill it before it is. So this is a question of Manasseh. He's trying to abort the idea. Right? He has conceived it, but he doesn't want to deliver it. What's the idea? Well, next sentence, the historic sentence. He actually gives you the answer. Atukuchubule, I feel relieved, amuktumuk, etc. Then next. The opposition between death instincts and the sexual or life instincts would then cease to hold. So now, now look at the devious way of argumentation. He has actually in his head, the theory is opposition between death instinct and sexual instinct. Then he asks the question, then he says, I can't answer it. Since I can't answer it, I feel relieved that my whole structure argument is wrong. Therefore, the opposition between death and sex need not be talked about. But of course, this is the only subject he's going to talk about for the rest of his life. This sentence is the first sentence in recorded history where the word death instinct appears, just not in Freud. This is the magical moment where, in today's term, the word Thanatos is coined. This is the statement, this is the signed sentence where Eros versus Thanatos play is declared. The interplay of Eros and Thanatos. But please note how terrified he is of his own theorization. <coughs> These are some of his counterexamples. What rubbish! Our Akpatapori, rubbish! Look at the person who's standing on the road. A bus comes by. What's his first instinct? Doesn't he try to save himself? Huh? This proves that there's no such thing as late instinct. That if the fa fundamental fact of life is self-preservation. Well, this theory is disproved. I'm relieved my structure of argument is all wrong. This is within two pages after having written this. Then he said, no, that's not the case. What does every human psyche aspire for? He aspires for his own death. Death is an individual making. Why should a bus come and do it for me? It's my business. <laughs> what is life but an extended story of death? Life is a preparation for death. Then he says, it sounds like a romantic poet. <laughs> and, and various such other utterances. Arubindad was too great a poet. He should not be merely called a romantic poet. Anyway, the, anyway, the pearl, <clears throat> he does talk about romantic poets. In fact, I use one German romantic poet. Uh, the, just two lines. And man sees the dark future. He must see death too. And he alone must fear it. This is a poem by Helderlin, and the title of the poem is Man. <coughs> I read again that this is something very peculiar to the Homo sapien. And man sees the dark future, he must see death too, and he, and he alone must fear it. The emphasis on the word alone. See, self-preservation must be true for all animals. But this fear of death, in a fear which is a fear for the femme fatale kind of stuff, 
which is actually enmeshed with coating is a different ball game altogether. <clears throat> Briefly put, the two concepts generated by uh, beyond the generated in beyond the pressure principle are <coughs> primary masochism and thanatos, and obviously they are linked. <coughs> Being a kind of a scientist, or who, someone who loves the word scientist someone who always tried to pass off his very many even poetic interjections in the garb of science. But good that he did it because he had, therefore he had this onerous responsibility on him, which was he has to prove what he says. Right? Merely assert, mere assertion uh, a novelist could have done, a poet could have done like Helen. Helen has no burden of proof to supply. But since I've chosen to be a scientist, I have to now prove that that instinct, instinct actually exists. How do I do it? And <clears throat> with this, the book ends, the Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Uh, as usual for Freud, when he's given a grave difficulties, he will, he will try to take support, help from some other philosopher, some other mighty thinker. Okay, this is exactly what happens. Towards the end of the book, Freud justifies, in fact, declares that his, his the idea of Thanatos or death instinct is absolutely correct. That is integral part of human psyche, just as Eros is, which is like preservation, is proved by, guess who? Gautam Buddha. <coughs> Here, he borrows an expression from a book written by one of his students named Barbara Lowe. It's a very simple book called Psychoanalysis, a brief account of the Freudian theory, a student uh, textbook kind of stuff. In that, she had coined a phrase called the Nirvana principle. And by that, she had meant nothing more than this, the desire of the newborn creature to return to that stage of omnipotence, that is, to the mother's womb. So that she called, for God knows why, Nirvana principle. Someone Freud loved the expression, and he, as to be expected, he borrowed it, but he borrowed it, and why in the very act of borrowing, he transformed it. Now, this is what he does to Nirvana principle. He says, there are only three types of dominating tendencies of mental life. Three types of dominating tendencies of mental life. Tendencies of mental, dominating tendencies, there are three. And each is geared to the effort of dealing with the internal tension due to stimuli. You receive external stimuli, there's an internal reaction to that. Because that's, that, that was the picture, you go external stimuli, so there is a you know, constant tension. You're trying to negotiate external world. So there's always an internal tension. And there are three types by which you try to negotiate. The three types of negotiation involve, number one involves reduction. You try to reduce the internal tension. Two, maintenance of constancy. No matter what happens, I'll remain where I am. And third, removal of internal tensions. Please note. Pratham Thutche, reduction. Reduction of what? Internal tension. Look, most psychoanalysts, psychiatrists just tell you this. Tension korbanna, tension korbanna. Jakhan bala hadu, ki bala hoche? Bala hoche, reduce your internal tension. Right? That's bound to happen. Internal tension, hukte baddur, reduce it, keep it manageable, otherwise, you'll, you'll flip. Second touch, bhanda me, maintenance of constancy, sthito pragga ho. All the good, good things that you hear in Gita and various other texts. <laughs> don't bother. All that is irrelevant. But the fantastic third. 
আর আমার ইন্টারনাল টেনশন যদি না থাকতো তাহলে কিছু হতো না আপনার স্থিতবর্গ হওয়া আমার খাওয়া দাওয়া হতো না সো রিমুভ ইন্টারনাল টেনশন ন ইফ ইউ ক্যান ইম্যাজিন ইফ ইউ হ্যাভ দ্য ডিজায়ার টু রিমুভ ইন্টারনাল টেনশন দ্য সাইক ইজ বিকামিং নাল অ্যান্ড ভয়েড রাইট দিস রিমুভাল ইন্টারনাল টেনশন হি ইকুয়েটস উইথ দ্য নির্বাণা স্টেট and this is nothing but death that for for centuries for thousands of years people have practiced people have tried to achieve a state of nirvana nirvana actually means no trishna annulment of trishna technically mane to thik hi ase trishna negation <coughs> trishna is the word used in buddhist khane uh, brahmanical or abhi kaam not to be confused with sexuality any desire would be come so freud ascribes to the epithet nirvana principle to the third type of negotiation that is to the effort directed at annihilating all disturbances provoked by any and every kind of stimulation therefore the nirvana principle provides the strongest possible defense for the faith in the he calls it faith in the existence of death instincts he still calling it a faith right faith in the uh, existence of death instincts corroborated by the <coughs> technology of nirvana right where you are trying to negate the self by ego whatever internal tension uh, is the maniki <coughs> all right this is the last part so we now have eros and thanatos at our disposal we now have in freud beginning from 19 clearly from 1920 onwards a double theorization that is danger has to be understood as something not stationed outside the psyche but stationed within the psyche right this makes the theory of danger brilliant right amar pratipakkho ami kintu sei pratipakkho tar moddhei prem ache this will completely change transform the theory of love that freud will seriously produce a new theory of love is not at all uh, accident <coughs> you might remember love is a form of hypnosis with certain conditions <laughs> which also tells you that love cannot long last <laughs> anyway now i'll i must finish by quarter to 6 right? no but the question is yeah. all right so <clears throat> i'll change the track partly and now concentrate on what i call not fraud but also call three affects this is a mad 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 game that freud played i've also remarked earlier that freud was one of the most obstinate thinkers just as he was a revisionist so also he was a obstinate thinker some sometime in his early life he had decided he just decided that <coughs> there are three everyday words i mean using the english equivalence fear fright and anxiety which people tend to use uh, recklessly interchangeably right they have no people have no money uh, linguistic sense right they have the must make words as messy as possible being a scientist he said i'll use those three everyday words and assign fixed meanings to them i think this is an absolutely irrational desire on the part of freud Right? He could have easily coined three uh, uh, Greek-sounding words. No, he would seize upon three everyday German words and then bestow great meaning to them. And he tussled and tussled and tussled. He wrote books after books on this idea. Of the three, the third concept, affect, anxiety. Guess how many years Freud spent on it? trying to understand what anxiety is trying to give a kind of a finished codified meaning unbelievable 50 years 
he battled with the idea. Then suddenly, suddenly, in anxiety's inhibition, symptoms, um, uh, inhibition, symptoms, anxiety, 1926, which is more than 100 page book, he said, devoted to anxiety, he, he couldn't find it. Then he was adding appendices. In the fourth appendix of one page, he suddenly got the idea that anxiety is, you've just heard, ektu agai, alam. The, the, that, that is state of anxiety. Alarm, anxiety is an internal alarm call. Right? And like, like all anxiety, like all alarm call, most anxieties are false alarms. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have anxiety stricken people. They are constantly false alarm. <laughs> Our Bangalis are given their pedagogic history. During examinations, they really show their anxiety. <laughs> Thanks to Mikali and others. <laughs> I think I should touch upon this one point before I go into this. Just one slight point. <clears throat> In 1932, the League of Nations had a committee called the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation. Very high sounding. Intellectual, uh, sorry, International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation. League of Nations directed the institute that they must organize an exchange of letters between two eminent intellectuals, right? And then be published in whatever language they write, plus English and French. Oh, three languages, English, French, and German. <clears throat> so the first person who was approached to open the conversation was Albert Einstein. And Einstein chose as his interlocutor, Sigmund Freud. And <clears throat> uh, the book, it's called, well, two letters, it's called Why War? It was published in 1933, but by then, Hitler had assumed power, and as a result, the book was immediately banned in German-speaking languages, uh, countries, because only for one reason, they were written by two Jews. <laughs> only one reason. So Germany did not know about this pamphlet, these two letters, t till about the end of Second World War. And whatever the discussion that takes place is actually under the sign of fascism, uh, this, this correspondence. Just a digression, the next year, 1934, the exchange of letters was between the Greek scholar Gilbert Murray, and he chose his interlocutor, was Rabindranath. Uh, next year, second year, which was on education, pedagogy. <coughs> now, in Why War, Einstein had asked Freud, that I can see all around me death and destruction. I see all around me hatred, right? Can something be done to the human psyche by which this destructive thing can be? I mean, man, man can you civilize the animal called the homo sapien is the question. And then Einstein also said, when I talk, when I talk about this uh, telltale signs of hatred all over. I am not, I am not talking about people at large, but rather I'm talking about intellectuals who are most susceptible to destructive suggestions. Okay. I think this is very important to remember that he's not, Einstein is not blaming people, but blaming the opinion makers. <coughs> to which Freud responded in a very roundabout manner, but a, a major piece of writing in which he now takes Eros and Thanatos as given. Right? That is, psychoanalysis has discovered this, unearthed the truth about human psyche. And 
If that is so, then death and destruction is impossible to be completely eliminated. Man is a destructive animal. In fact, Freud begins by saying the better word, instead of talking about might and right, a better word would be if you replace might by violence. The more banal and everyday word. Man is a violent animal, full stop. But this violence has two aspects. It, some, it is sometimes other-oriented, and sometimes it is <coughs> self-oriented. Self-oriented will lead to Thanatos, that is part of it. But a very peculiar thing that Freud says, which he doesn't really develop, this introjection of Thanatos, of the death instinct towards myself, might be the root cause of conscience. Can you look at hoy? Why do people at all think of these questions? It is because I'm ready to go. I, it's, 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 uh, I, I'm not just, just not in love with my little uh, life. So it's very interesting to suggest that Thanatos is the root cause of Vivek and Anando with the So together, you get the picture. <coughs> the <laughs> so he calls this aggressive or de destructive instinct. This is mere digression, but uh, just, just, just to suggest that how Eros Thanatos, which he, Monash Nishri Bodhi, the faith in this death instinct, has now become transformed into a, f a finally settled kind of conceptualization. Now, <clears throat> if we take the trouble of collecting whatever he said about fear, fright, and anxiety, three states, from various books like Totem and Taboo, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, Inhibition, Symptoms, and Anxiety, An Outline of Psychoanalysis, and others. This is the picture that emerges. I will not have the time to actually go into showing that how the, these diff distinctions produce immense number of corollaries. But it's just a, the, I think, productive thing about any good idea is, at the basal level, it is very simple. So simple that even one might feel that it can't be worked upon. But a little thought would show that this simplicity is only a cover for a kind of a variegated complexities. So let's have this picture. We have at our disposal three affective states. So column, affective state, first column. Second, what is the danger situation attached to this affective state? Third is what is the psychological condition of the subject of persecution, someone who is undergoing this? And what is the profile of the persecutor? These are the four questions. Uh, one is a question, three questions related to each state. This is the answer that he gives. Fright. Fright is, danger situation is, when someone runs into danger without being prepared for it. Very simple definition. Say I go out of the room and a car comes near me, then that would be I get frightened. My reaction is that of a frightened subject. <coughs> Therefore, the psychological condition of the subject of persecution is completely unprepared. And the persecutor is absolutely indefinable. Jeko Uttabari is beyond my reach. At one state, this is the simplest state of Ustha. At the same time, this is the most fearsome. Right? And this is the basic dangerous situation in which you all live. Ekkuri right? kiyohabi. Fear, when someone apprehends a definite object to be a danger, <coughs> when someone apprehends a definite object to be a danger. etc. So psychological condition of the subject of persecution is fully prepared. 
and the persecutor is absolutely definable. Please note, fright and fear have become just opposed conditions. Hmm? Isn't, it, isn't it beautiful, actually? And note, from fear theke, you can create persecuting mania. Right? <coughs> persecuting the mania that uh, I am persecuted is the atathake, the mania to persecute others. <laughs> Which I think is a far more solid thing than the other one. <laughs> Anxiety, the third affective state, Freud breaks it up into two parts. Realistic anxiety and neurotic anxiety. Realistic anxiety, the danger situation is, when someone expects or prepares himself for a known danger which threatens from A, without or within. Some known danger. Agata Chilo, definite object as danger. So, it had to complicate it. So, psychological condition is reproducing an original reaction of helplessness in the face of some internal or external but known danger in the form of a signal for help. That is as if anxiety only comes when there's a prototype. There's some, something had happened as original trauma which you are trying to reproduce and therefore you're always sending a signal for help. That's why the alarm clock became for him the answer to the riddle of anxiety. That the internal organism is setting up an alarm. What, what is it doing? It is reminding you that there is a pattern in the danger situation. In case of first, there's no pattern. So that in, in case of a known danger, this becomes a concrete entity. In case of neurotic anxiety, when someone expects or prepares himself for an unknown danger, I get a known and unknown danger, which threatens from without or within, so therefore you are producing an original reaction of helplessness, same structure, in the face of some internal or external but unknown danger in the form of a signal for help. So the persecutor becomes abstract and for the most part indefinable. Now, <clears throat> I have already suggested, but I don't have the time now to build on these affective states and the internal relationship. One can really, really, I can assure you, produce countless lemmas out of this simple definition. But instead, I'm going to do something else. Something which Freud did not do. Did not do me, he could not have done. He missed out on something which is very, very major. That is, Freud died in 19. 39, just a few days after the beginning of Second World War. I've already said that much of psychoanalysis comes out of a reaction to the war, and particularly First World War and other systems. I'm certain Freud would have reworked worked upon his theory of Thanatos had he known of Auschwitz, had he known of the huge violence perpetrated by the Nazi regime. He himself suffered, but I mean, he never knew the scale of violence, uh, which would have told him that the idea of Thanatos that he had uh, spawned seems to be out of sync with the range of violence. <coughs> there must be something else working, which I'm going to try to fill up a gap in Freud, which was only because of his Thanatos. He died too quickly, though in 1939. If he had managed to survive more years, he could have produced this theory. In 1906, 1945, is a date which cannot be forgotten. It's the Hiroshima day. <laughs> it's the day when atom bomb was first released, which actually showed what? That, number one, a very simple, elegant equation of Albert Einstein, E equal to mc square, had actually fructified. That mass could be converted into energy multiplied by the square of speed of light. If the theorem was m equal to e c square, nothing would have happened. Right? It is because e could be, tremendous energy could be released by just annihilating small mass is the wonder. What does that mean? 
what immediate, what is clear from Hiroshima point is this. If you look back into world history, hum human imagination, in all cultures of the world, there are endless accounts of proloi apocalypse, right? Absolute death, destruction of everything and everybody. But with the coming of the nuclear bomb on 1945, that something, that total destruction moves from the domain of the myth to the domain of the real. It is now feasible. It is not just probable, but also possible. Right? And the probability is at the level of uh, demonstrably real. It can, it can happen at any moment. If that is the case for human beings, then obviously we're living in a new world of anxiety. Anxiety was reproducing an original reaction of helplessness in the face of some internal or external thing. If now, just not my death, but death of everybody becomes a state condition of human existence, then it must alter the notion of anxiety. It must alter the notion of Thanatos. For what has happened to death pre-1945, which is still existing, obviously, death has a calendar pace, which is, let's call it, to use the Sasurian words, diachronic in measure. That is, it is expected the older people will die, then only the younger people die. When an older person dies, it is a something to be lamentable, but not a cause for melancholia. Right? But when the younger people die before the older man, that is really, really cause of distress. Right? Uh, as when Hamlet was constantly wearing that black garb, trying to mourn his father, the psychoanalyst, the uncle, Claudius, he was the real psychoanalyst, he said, what is the, why this inky cloth that you're wearing? Uh, death of fathers is the law. Fathers will die. Uh, uh, so what's the, this is an unnatural behavior on your part. I'm suggesting from 1945 onwards, the meaning of Thanatos gets completely transformed from diachronic to synchronic. Right? It is now possible to think of a moment, possible to consider, when everything and anything, uh, everything and everything will vanish at the same time. Right? So saying, after me deluge is now a commonplace conceit. If that, hap if that happens, I suggest, Freud notion of Thanatos was limited by, in my opinion, finally it's all said and done, individualistic Thanatos. Right? But now we live in a world which is, I call it, globalized Thanatos, which obviously means the idea of death has undergone a transformation. The notion of neurotic anxiety has undergone complete change. And I suggest that in order to understand this new altered economy of death, we have, we have come to a, we have to think of a new effect. I, I submit fear, fright, anxiety are not sufficient to account for the present state. And I submit that fourth effect as terror. Uh, <coughs> and therefore, my definition of terror is when someone expects a known danger which threatens from within and or from without, along with the full knowledge that the danger will fall suddenly from an unexpected square, unexpected quarter. There is a knowledge, there is suddenness, yet unexpected. It's terrifying, actually. Right? And uh, <clears throat> in 60s, started from 50s, but became powerful in 60s and 70s, in Europe, uh, <clears throat> a lot of work was done on the notion of the nuclear, and what emerged at that time was called nuclear criticism. Right? Uh, one of the contributors of nuclear criticism is Jacques Derrida, among others. Uh, of course, but the, all the French thinkers are to be found in this. Uh, just one quotation from a play. Uh, this is a German play. Uh, the title of the play is J. Robert Oppenheimer. I hope you know when the first atom bomb plus took place experiment. 
that is the f that is number one. Number two is Hiroshima. Uh, number three, Nagasaki. <coughs> Oppenheimer, the father of atom bomb, when he saw the explosion, he was immediately reminded of the Gita from the eleventh chapter, the splendor of Krishna. Uh, Oppenheimer, being a German, is also a trained Indologist, <laughs> and just as Freud was. Freud, uh, dynamic Indian text quote with him. And, uh, Robert uh, Oppenheimer, this play by Heine Kiephardt, uh, it's called In the Matter of J. Sorry, uh, title of the play is In the Matter of J. J meaning J. Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, I think this, this sentence is very nice. The ability to extinguish all life upon earth is a new attribute. The ability to extinguish all life upon earth, and that is to at one stroke, is a new attribute. This newness, this new attribute, is yet to be fully recognized. I also submit, if Thanatos undergoes such a dramatic transformation, which is cumulative in character, as years pass by, it will become deeper and deeper, I submit the notion of eros too has been transformed. In fact, looking at the world today and the, and the everyday sexual nexus and practices, Internet is, of course, very important in this case. I'm certain that the notion of eros with which Freud worked is only partly applicable now. There is something new happening which is yet to be uh, taken into account, understood. Although the first proposition, the eros and Thanatos are interlocked, is inviolable. But what happens? Let us, well, it is upon us to historicize the eros Thanatos bind, because it cannot be the same. And uh, just to <clears throat> remind you that nuclear criticism is not something which was not uh, registered in Bangla. Uh, you have at least one dramatist who wrote more than three plays, and more uh, actually three plays completely devoted to the Hiroshima moment was Badul Sharkar in Trinkshu Shatabdi, etc., which actually made it possible for him to move on to third theater. That was just before he came to third theater, which meant to him that existing hitherto dramatic practices have become irrelevant. This is the question point, that we have reached a moment, even through Freudian psychoanalysis, where a sense of irrelevancy, things are irrelevant, has become extremely strong. And that needs to be politicized. I submit Freud is one thinker who allows this very urgent politicization of certain everyday feelings uh, feasible. On that happy note, or an unhappy note, I end. We still have about uh, uh, half an hour to go, so you can have. Please, please. Uh, Shivaji, I promised in the recess that I might be asking a few questions to you for learning. But I don't promise an answer. <laughs> uh, regarding one small addition, uh, along with terror, you bring in the concept of horror. You see, terror is a perspective from the perspective of the perpetrators, the actors, and horror, the victims. Okay? There is the, this is the necessity, and it is to be brought within the fold of the parameters of your coinages mm. extending fright. And what will happen to that? That is it. This theory apart. I'm personally interested to know that how come for the Bengali middle class, Freud was a matter of romance. We have been strongly fascinated by Freud. What is the explanation? What could be the explanation of it? Uh, does it require itself a Freudian analysis? But this intrigues me. How come? that the Bengali intelligentsia had been so very fascinated by Freud. Um, 
think of the kollol or prior to that even falling up, down to. And uh, how come it is not simply intellectuals, but in general, actually it has flowed down into the everyday affair. Uh, I do not know if in Germany, Germans themselves are as fascinated by Freud as Bengalis in Bengal. So much they had been. I don't know. But this is my personal query. The first part. There is no doubt that Freud since we're discussing affects, we had only three words, fear, fright, and anxiety. I, I just feel that in the present environment, coming from, starting from H. D. Hiroshima today, certain things have happened which cannot be explained within the structure of these three affects. Therefore, I require a fourth affect, X. Right? Now, it is up to me, as a kid, for a kind of a neurologist in college, you know, I could have chosen horror, I could, I could have chosen other words also. And it's not true that it's only from one perspective. Both can happen on one. Other the theory can't work. The, it has to take into account fear, fright, anxiety, both sides. Otherwise, it's not theory. So similarly, we could do for this. You might choose horror, you might just keep it as X. There will be no, no problem. Right? But the point is, I require an excess of this affix. I choose terror because of the present political significance of the word. There is a kind of a moment of choice. In the moment of choice, the word is not merely a word. The word springs from what I see all around me. In this case, it is interesting. The word terrorist was politically first applied in Kolkata. <coughs> the colonial started in 1905-1908. Now it has become globalized from Kolkata. But of course, that history of forgotten. That is, <coughs> the Bengalis were first marked as terrorists. No, this English word was applied. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for the second question that you raised, which is about <coughs> the second question that you just remind me. Bengalis and oh, we got the All right. Now, this is Obrivo Ghosh is working on psychoanalysis in Bengal. And Here's other quite a few facts. I hope this is correct. Well, that is, in 1970, the University Psychology Department, they introduced a paper on psychoanalysis. Possibly in the world, this is the first instance that an academic, academically, psychoanalysis has been taught. In Kolkata, in Kolkata, 1970. 1917, Freud is also rather young. 1939, he will die. He has yet to write beyond the pleasure principle. Right? He's yet to go out of his own framework. To use a word which Bengalis have now fallen in love with, he's yet to deconstruct psychoanalysis. Right? But by then, this psychoanalysis reaches Kolkata, and a group of people, they all get very excited by it. I consider this to be a case of arrest, meaning that if you read whatever Griva has also actually shown quite decisively, that Bengali intellectuals' understanding of Freud is frozen up to the moment of interpretation of dreams. Right? They don't move, they don't even understand beyond the pleasure principle, they don't even come up to this. Now the interesting thing is, whatever they write, whatever they theorize, they have one object one object of great love and hate, who is Rabindranath. So all they create, they analyze through Rabindranath is Shaito. And Rabindranath, who has not read a word of Freud, is, bound, is forced to read Freudian analysis of whatever these people are right. So Rabindranath is agitated, the internal tension he never knew how to control, and therefore he, he keeps on writing the rebuttals. And Rabindranath actually produces the best critique of the Bengali understanding of psychoanalysis without even addressing the word of fraud, which is really, really fascinating. And how he constantly critiques the idea of dream work in the vulgar Freudian sense, which is brilliant. But I 
I hope when you will come out, then uh, the community will come to know about the, all these interesting details, which have been more or less forgotten. Now, Bengalis twist with Freud, maybe coupled with Bengalis play with Marx, that too has a very limited kind of appeal. And then that too, what, what, what do we mean by Karl Marx? It's basically, uh, it will be, it will boil down to Kihomi, Communist Manifesto, and some few writings, and then they heard of 1844 manuscripts, then they heard of alienation, etc. Et <coughs> but in party writing, in function, whatever, what do we get out of, uh, out of Marx? Or at best, uh, his essays on, on, on the condition of India, which are very, very doubtful essays, which are uh, and any, no, no internal critic of Marx is also made. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm very, very surprised that it is interesting that 20th century Bengali intellectuals and general people have played around with two of the most major thinkers of 20th century. But uh, peculiarly, except for Ubinarat, I can't name anybody in the domain. Well, not, not the colonel group, not, not, not any. Because Freud was, became a kind of a, a surrogate word for sexuality. But that's not Freud. Actually, not even sexuality, it became the sex. Yes. <laughs> Just in continuity, you see, could it be that we Bengali middle class are in a way following Freudian linguistics? In masochist. Oh. Bengali premics, they are. <laughs> <laughs> you see? You understand what I mean? <laughs> 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 no, 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 this is not Freudian. Because primary masochism means that it's integral to everybody. There's nothing bigger about it. No nationalism will work here. Right? <laughs> and as far as Freud's fame in other parts of the world, and this is a famous story. Freud was never, never well received by any of us. And at that time, Hume was with him. Hume was yet to be expelled. So, Tafna Jubara, Cyprus, and Jubara, and Hume. Uh, and, uh, and Freud was, as I said, not well received. Number one, we could not understand half the thing that Freud was saying. They couldn't understand his accent, his English accent. And Freud was quite depressed by the reception. So they were walking on the road, Jung and Freud, and suddenly he heard <coughs> one American saying to the other, ah, so what did you say? So if I look at them, they don't even understand each other. You expect them to understand me? So we not be understood in various parts of so I was just wondering, like, uh, can we link in any way Freud with, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, that's Freud, just the theory of Thanatos, that is uh, death instinct with martyrdom, I mean, nationalism. Sure. But the point is, besides, as I said, getting out of the understood without some kind of us. Anything that's akin to suicide, there are various kinds of martyrdom is one form, you know, of course, that's true. That's true. Nationalism and Thanatos, that they can relate. Sure, sure. So if you have a nationalist Thanatos. Nationalism. <laughs> Shivaji, how, how would you regard, how would you evaluate the work of, uh, say, persons like Herbert Marcuse or Eric Fromm, who have tried to bring Marx and Freud together? Eurasian civilization. And one dimensional man. One dimensional man. <coughs> OK, for a long time, Across the world, it was a kind of a project, an agenda, uh, to <coughs> match Freud and Freud and Marx. It's too, uh, one uh, slight example. When you talk about the Kollul Jug, when you talk about that, this part of this part of writing, this, this period, you'll find all the writers, no matter how elitist they are in, in the final recording, are talking about two things. One is sexuality, and the other other is poverty. Now, that, the two thematics which were very powerful. It is interesting in the, in the Marxian writing in Bengal, the poverty part remained, sexual part faded away. One reason why, with the rise of Marx, Freud had to pass out in Bengal. Though there was one moment, as I pointed out, where they were interlocked. I'm not saying it was intellectually informed, but at least the understanding, the question of sexuality and poverty, should be raised at the same time. It's not a kind of choice, that, that kind of bite. 
Okay, generally speaking, I'm skeptical about all basic projects which are trying to match Freud and Marx in such a manner, and think in terms of such fluidity, <laughs> as if all their concepts can be translated from one to the other, as if the unconscious can be linked. I, I, do, I do that myself, a kind of a metaphorical uh, move from there to the theory of exchange value and use value. Mm -hmm. Consciousness, unconscious, as a kind of a prototype of this movement. I, I suppose such such things are permissible, possible, but after all, one must understand that we are talking about two aspects of human life, right? and there is no goddamn reason to think that one can be translated into the other. But maybe a better enterprise could be to think of some, not so holistic, but it is partly holistic theory, taking into account inputs from both both the thinkers. Why try to <coughs> mitigate one in by the other? That project seems to me after point boring. But I'm quite fond of European civilization. This is, this is to me it's a very romantic book, but I like reading it. So more than that I'm not ready to say. So but from I think is different. Yeah, from is different. Yeah, you, you can't combine uh, for, I mean Mark use is one. Oh. Eric from is different. Hmm. So your answer doesn't fit in with no, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saying that uh, no, but, but neither does neither does uh, Marcus do that. But I, I'm saying that there's a general kind of an approach of which I'm skeptical. Sure, if from uh, Mar Marcus, they remain very very important pointers to a possible dialogue between Marx and Freud. Thank you. So, uh, like this is uh, more of. Uh, uh, so like um, in the uh, uh, essay Beyond the Pleasure Principle, uh, at least the part, the excerpts that have been included in the Freud reader, there's mentioned that, uh, he mentions that how narcissism is not linked to the sexual instinct because it's not directed towards an other but towards the uh, self and hence like uh, so, and in this sense, if you connect this this with what you mentioned about, uh, you know, like like uh, what is life but an, but an extensive preparation for death, death so in this sense, I mean, it's almost like even even in the death instinct, there is an narcissistic element, right, in which you want to avoid unpleasure, and hence you invest so much in death, in 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 thinking beyond. I mean, you want to like do away with your sense sense of self because it's it kind of produces uh, that that sense of split, that sense of pain. So I mean, in this sense, is is what he talks about as. Uh, Death instinct is it, is it really very different from another form of self obsession? I mean, because. Okay. Firstly, uh, narcissism, this word, I think it occurs in Beyond the Pressure Principle, but it just occurs. It's not worked upon. And uh, <coughs> his great work on narcissism is called, it's, it's short, it's an essay called Narcissism, mm -hmm. okay, which comes later. <coughs> But you know, it too has the same quality as Beyond the Pleasure Principle, where he's making a thesis and then a counter thesis. So he begins, narcissism, as I begin the first page, he says, narcissism is a feature of those men who flee from women in their adult period. Meaning, narcissism is a monopoly of homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? This is page number one. Page number three, he says, I'm quite wrong. And whenever he says I'm wrong, he has his favorite word called primary. He says, there's something called primary narcissism. Whether you flee from women or never never leave them, everybody is narcissistic. Right? It suddenly becomes like primary mesochism, primary narcissism. Now, uh, I will sell in the Freud perhaps forgotten the story of the narcissist when he's writing into Beyond the Pleasure Principle. But he read up. Freud very often makes mistakes in his mythological, uh, particularly Indian texts. He makes a mess out of it. But uh, here he got it completely right. This is the story of Narcissus. In short, Narcissus is not guilty of self-love. Narcissus was a very handsome man. Men and women all appealed to him for succor, and he refused. He never slept with anybody, okay? Because he did not find 
any man or woman worth him. Then he was lying beside a lake or something. Then he looked down and then he suddenly found someone who appealed to him most. So from Narcissus' point of view, he was looking at an other. Then in trying to embrace that other, he jumped and into death. And then he realized that other was the self. Narcissus is a great story where you suddenly recognize your other is self. But there is a gap between the realization. That gap constitutes narcissism. It's not self-love. It's an other love which, will, which is deferred self-love. And therefore, you require a completely different kind of theorization. Now, but the vulgar, the, the, model, the pop reading of narcissism is this, Aktoprem. And narcissism says, Aktoprem chino na. Narcissism means, he is premi khuja varachi, patche na. Like most people. <laughs> That's why it's primary. व्यक्तिगत बंधु छोड़ने मध्य अत रिच एक कलेक्टिव आनकनसियसप्ट इत्यादि रही है आइनसटाइन चिठी टाइम के ना दिए फ्रड के क्या दिल मैंने फ्रयडियन मडलटा कि तक मैं एकदम जो आप कथा मत मारा खेजू अनेक हो जाए ठीक है मैं यटार आंसार हम तो यू अनेक भलो दीते ठीक है से ना जेहेतु तरह से एक मैं कलेक्टिव अनकसियसर मत अत बड़ा एक टुल छो उ फ्रएड और इंडिविजुअल चले ग ठीक है एक प्रश्न मैं कारण फ्रएड के देवा उन्हीं जेहेतु एवं एकदम व्यक्तिगत बंधु उन व्यक्तिगत बहु कथोपकथन आदि ये एक प्रश्न और द्वित जेहेतु ये उठल जिज्ञेस कर संगे रिलेटेड फ्रैंकफार्ट स्कूल मार्क्यूज विशेषकर मार्क्यूजर लेखार मध्य भीषण रकम एडलार आज जो एडवर्ट एडलार आज जो एडभार्टाइजमेंट भांग एडभार्टाइजमेंट गो किसप्लयट कर शुद्ध तो सेक्सुअलिटी ना इनफिरियरिटी कमप्लेक्स का एक्सप्लयट कर फ्रएड इनकमप्लीट फ्रएड एडलार के स्नाप कर बसिए रेखे एकदम वही जैगागुल आलोचन ही करते दें एकदम जस्ट सीम्पलि कि पेट फेभारिट कन्सेप्ट बैठे खूब बसि जान नहीं मार्क्यूजर इंडेक्स बोले एडलार एक बार नाम आज ठीक है क्योंकि फ्रएड 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 मैं ये कि पागलानी ना कि एरा इच्छा कर एडलार नाम करेंगे नाम करें ना कि आर बोलिए इंटेलेक्चुअल असतता को खूब भक्त सब मतमत कार्य मन कर ग्रहणजोग्य मन उत्तर संगेस बंधु बंधुत फर्स्ट वर्ड इज बैसेक्सुअलिटी 
So if everybody is bisexual, then every sexual act has not two but four. Ebar chile ki pawan hote the fly si ka apda diye chhe. Ebar jo hum bisexual theorize korbe, tar birat food note bhi, tar bolte ki shabhi amar kotha, ta apar hoy ashobho ashat flies or tabi kore eta or bolle. বলে এগুলো সব ছিল আর একটা কেটে বলে মা তো আমার কাছে পিএইচডি করতে এসেছিল সেই সব বলেছিল আর ইজ অলওয়েজ ডিফেন্ডিং হ্যাঁ বলে আছে এটা মেনে নেবার ফর্মে একটা ছোট্ট বক্তব্য আছে বক্তব্যটা এই জাস্ট অ্যাজ উই সেডিজমের গল্প তিনি সব ফ্রয়েড ধার করেছিলেন যে অ্যাজ আই সেড ইন এভরি অ্যাক্ট অফ হিজ লোন देयर ইজ আ ট্রান্সফরমেশন মানে হি হ্যাজ অফ কোর্স বোরোড ফ্রম সো মেনি পিপল এন্ড অফ কোর্স ইট ইজ আন মানে আনফরগিভেবল দ্যাট হি ক্লেমস দ্যাট এভরি পয়েন্ট গুলো আমারই সব সময় ছিল But if we just not fly the theory of homosexuality, its after point is untenable, rubbish. Right? And um, Freud's the theory of homosexuality is, in my opinion, deeply problematic, but not rubbish. It's not harsh or weird. Flies in it. It is deeply problematic. I, I refuse to buy Freud. But if I have to discuss homosexuality, I can only mention flies in the footnote. I'll have to talk about Freud's reworking. That is the case. I, I have to agree that flies created the concept, but if I have to make a theoretical discussion, flies will only be in my footprint. He cannot have it in any other place. That kind of feeling. just one last question uh, the popular conception is that the unconscious comprises of both the id and the uh, super ego but in the essay the id and the ego uh, 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 freud make this very mis uh, you know mystifying puzzling statement where he says that whereas unconscious is the font of font of like unpleasure or uh, pain uh, you know in the id it's basically a pleasure principle without the reality principle so how can i mean if unconscious comprises of the id as a part then how can the id be you know pleasure principle See, i mean uh, the the word pleasure principle is very misleading term first it thought of pleasure principle then it thought of unpleasure principle then it thought of pleasure hyphenated unpleasure principle then it said this is becoming very cumbersome then it said just pleasure principle because pleasure includes our pleasure he talked with the idea pleasure and pleasure principle then we could a shor naam to uchchani kora jay so please explain it once more no when he first thought of pleasure principle as you said pleasure then obviously you have to think of an adverse he called it unpleasure principle he coined the word unpleasure it is completely wrong then he thought ki eta to this is not i am discussing both at the same time so then he put a hyphen mark pleasure hyphen and pleasure principle then it become very cumbersome then he decided well the word pleasure is sufficient pleasure must have an iota of pleasure in it to bound to have so pleasure principle should not should not be laid now read as pleasure in the everyday sense but it is constitutive of pleasure and 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 pleasure it against the reality principle This will become enriched when he once he admits fun pain as a integral aspect of human psyche. Sir, I just want to connect one sir one one point. You said that Indian psychoanalytical society is stuck at the Freud's dream interpretation theory, but I think this is not the correct information. I am myself a practicing psychoanalyst, and we have come a long way from Freud's classical psychoanalysis. to andre green kanberg sudhir kakkar and so many other people in in calcutta only of course we are following the classical theory of psychoanalysis which we have come a long way from sigmund freud but in other parts of india like in mumbai and delhi we are practicing the other evolutions of psychoanalytical theory so this is not correct to say that we are stuck here at the interpretation of dream theory of sigmund freud i didn't say that i didn't say that that we indians i said that the bengali writing of psychoanalysis in the in the 20th century up to the 40s till till 50s was predicated upon the dream theory no, not really not really because gurinder shekhar bose's theory is quite different from no, the no, theory no, of sigmund freud 
I understand. Give me a shepherd bush. Shop no is is uh, important as, as a kind of a departure. It's not from... only shop no. He has so many yeah, books created. Yeah. He, uh, his concept of depression, his theory uh, of new mental life, and the, his interpretation of Mahabharata and Yog yeah, Sutra yeah. is quite uh, different from Sigmund yeah. Freud's theory. Agreed. But uh, even Gurinder Shekhar's influence in the Bengali writing. I'm not talking about uh, say Gurinder Shekhar as a psychoanalyst writing. But the question was that we have stuck with Freud for a long time in Calcutta. No, we are not really stuck no, no, with no. Freud. We are stuck. It's not stucking point of stucking. This is about the basic theory of psychoanalysis, which is given by Sigmund Freud. It no. is not that we are stuck at Freud. No, 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 we no. are stuck at no. the classical theory of psychoanalysis. But the question to which I gave the answer was, why the Bengalis were so fascinated with Sigmund Freud? Because. Our first psycho the knowledge of psychoanalysis was uh, in India came from Gurinder Shekhar Bose, who has a correspondence with Sigmund Freud. So that I know. So we are fascinated by that. If you say yes, no, then yes. No, no, no. We're not. Gurinder Shekhar is one player in this game. Yeah. But there are many other people who who write, even even novices. I mean, I'm talking about literary criticism. I'm talking about people whose name people have forgotten. Not unlike Gurinder Shekhar Bose. When this discourse became generalized. And, and became, it could be found in any Bengali writing. It is at that point in history. Now we don't find, they all vanished. But at that juncture, if we, if we make a kind of a study of the discourse that was centered around Freud, then what is the textual universe of the discourse is the question. This will not fit in the Shabar Bushu. This will not fit other trained psychoanalysts who will come a little later. But this will fit more or less, I'm talking about literary criticism in per se, where Freud became a very important force and name uh, in, in that period. And mean, any, any writer would, would, would celebrate Freud. At that juncture, where the high point is 30s, 40s. See, uh, you mentioned that uh, Catholic University. No, I'm not sure. Seven, no, 1917. But you're you right. You know, Calcutta University is a laggard so far as course making is concerned. They adapt things much late in the day. But think of the novelist, Manik Bandhubadhyay, and people like that. They have made use of Freud, host of writers, including my father, in his earlier part of his career. Sure. So actually, Freud was almost a household figure. Do you understand? Now, that is my sociological question. Now, what is there in the Bengali life, Bengali psyche, Bengali mentality, or the middle class in Bengal? Okay, since you are a trained sociologist, you give the answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is my question. Do you approve? Approve? Of this question. Uh, if I take you as a Freud specialist, yeah, I'm a sociologist, all right. Now, you see, this is a question to me that what is there within us or among us that has made Freud very, very fascinating? One simple answer, which may not be frivolous, is that um, um, <coughs> the heavy dose of inhibition and repression, yeah. uh, which became a landmark of the Bhadralog identity. Absolutely. Very good. For, for that, you require a kind of a counter. Freud had a kind of a pornographic appeal that has to be granted. Mm -hmm. There were many writers, obscure writers, who have written sex pamphlets after sex pamphlets in the name of analyzing Freud. Because you get you get the chance to talk about something in the garb of science, which otherwise you don't. I, and those writings are really, really horrible. But, uh, so lots of books now in the center, but I know this person's grandson, so I know this, I've, I've forgotten his name. Uh, the, entire family, the entire family rejected him. He had to stay alone in the house. I think this side to my mind is a good point, the sub subject matter of study. You know, you're right, I think, we Bengali searched for liberators. Yeah, emancipated. One we found in Marx, and the other we found in Freud. Both so what, what's happening now? <laughs> 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 and that is my point. Okay, we have to stop somewhere. <laughs>